Good morning. I'm your pastor, Reverend Dr. Vaughn Hayden. I'm glad to be here with you, to, to worship with you, to, to uh, expound upon the Scripture, to, to read God's Word and see how God fulfills His promise. We've been looking at the promise for the last several weeks through Isaac, and we know how the, the story begins. I hope you, you know God made a promise to bless the world, and God knows the world needs blessed. Remember, God at one time looked at the world as it was and was completely sorry for what he'd made. And he stopped short of starting completely over, saving just a few so that we could, he could begin again. And then centuries after the repopulation, after Noah and his children got off the ark, uh, God was still looking for someone that would trust him, someone who would follow him, someone who would worship him, someone of faith, a man, a person, a family, a nation. And he found a person through whom he could bless the world, this person he called Abram, to go to a land that he would show him where he could be the father of many. And through Abram's seed, the promise was that the world would be blessed. God made that promise early, Genesis chapter 11. And God always keeps his promises. Promise keeper. As we fast forward through the story, we know that the promise came in the boy named He Laughs. I mean, his name is Isaac, but I just like throwing that in because He Laughs is such a great name. Uh, what was so amazing about the promise is that God continued to prove Abram's faith through the whole process. It didn't just happen. He made the promise, and the promise came through. He made the promise, and then there was waiting, and there was struggle, and there was faith development. There was walking. There was going through situations, even to the point where Abram's name was changed to Abraham, where he was told instead of just being the father of many, he would be the father of many nations. And while he was nearing 100 years old, Without the promised child appearing yet, Abraham thought God had to do something amazing. And so God did. Miracle worker, that was part of the song, right? God did the miracle. God kept his promise in a way that only God could do, proving that God was behind this blessing of the world, that God truly wanted to bless the world, that God truly was calling this family, God truly was forming this nation and it was not simply the will of man. It wasn't simply Abraham's desire, Abraham's accomplishment, because Abraham could not do, and Sarah could not do what only God could do to make this happen. And we've covered all this already a couple weeks ago, and more as we saw how God continued to prove Abraham's faith and grow Isaac's faith as they went to the mountain to worship, and God provided the lamb. But Isaac was protected by the Lord. Last week we saw how God orchestrated events to provide Isaac with a wife. Because as Abraham was nearing 140 years old and still did not have any grandchildren that could ease his mind about the promise, he still had to trust God. The promise was that he would be the father of many nations and he's nearing 140 and he has one child of the promise and no heirs after that. Where's this nations? Where's this Abundant seed. He still had to trust God. Nearing 140 years old, still had to trust God. And that's kind of the point. That's kind of always the point. We might like to think, because we like things easy. I have a button in my office, the easy button. I think Bruce Helstern gave it to me. And uh, I very rarely get to press it. Because nothing ever comes easy. Now, a couple of the... The children like to come in and press it. That was easy. But uh, it's just not, it's not easy. Because we don't get to the point where we can say, that's all fixed, that's all covered, I don't need to worry about anything. Uh, we can't get to the point where we can say it's all good now. We can't get to the point where we don't need any more faith. And I hope I never get to that point. Because we always need faith. And that's what we see through Abraham and Isaac, that, that, that faith is what keeps them going because they know they always need God to make it happen. Faith is the evidence of things unseen. 
certainty for what is yet to happen. But we might think we'd like to relax. We should never relax in our faith. And we see this clearly as the story of the promise continues as we continue to look in Genesis in chapter 25 is where we're at today. We're going to start in verse 14 or 19. And it's an interesting, an interesting way the story shifts. You see in chapter 25, verse 19. The story clearly shifted from Abraham to Isaac. And so has the promise. Because yes, the promise was to Abraham, but the promise goes through Isaac. And then from Isaac on through and down through and down through until the promise is finally realized in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Anyway, Genesis 25, verse 19, we begin reading. It says, These are the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Paddan Aram, sister of Laban, the Aramean. So the passage begins by saying, these are the descendants of Isaac, when as yet there are no descendants of Isaac introduced. Even as it begins by saying these are the descendants of Isaac, it starts instead mentioning the ancestors. It's kind of a way of saying, we're going to begin talking about Isaac's children now, because we haven't talked about it thus far, and so that's why it says, but just to be sure you know who Isaac is, he's Abraham's, Abraham's son. The promise continues. And then he was 40 years old, it said, when he married Rebekah. Remember who Rebekah is? He's kind of reminding us, you know, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean, sister of Laban, the Aramean, kind of letting us know the pivotal point. Isaac was 40 years old when he got married. And just so the reader knows who Rebecca is, he includes the ancestry so he knows she's not a heathen Canaanite woman. She's not one of those heathens from that land that they're, they're entering. I mean, the Canaanites, of course, that's where Sodom and Gomorrah were. That's the whole place that was going to be destroyed and has been destroyed and several times there. And also to remind some of, to remind us who are hearing and listening to the word, that these people he's talking about have already seen God at work. We talked about that last week, where they said, this is surely the work of God. How can we say anything against it? We have to go with it, because if God is doing something, I better get with it. And if you don't have that mindset, I suggest you adopt it. If God is doing something, you better get with it. Because if you don't get with what God is doing, it would seem to be you're going against what God's doing. I don't recommend that. Anyway, with the promise and the balance, things are still not easy. As verse 21 begins, Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. We thought it would be easy now, right? Abraham has a child. His child grows up. Finally, Abraham's child, Isaac, gets married. Hallelujah. He gets married 40 years old. But finally, okay, now the grandchildren come, right? No. Another woman who has trouble conceiving. Another family that does not seem to be able to make this happen by themselves. Another opportunity for the whole blessing thing to fall apart, for the whole promise to not be fulfilled, perhaps, but it's also another chance for God to do something amazing. How many of you know God likes to do amazing things? You can raise your hand in your home. That's fine. God likes to do amazing things. It's his specialty. It's another chance for God to be trusted and God to be found faithful. It's another chance for faith to be developed through Isaac and Rebekah as they learn to lean not on their selves, but to lean on God. Another chance to see how God's going to do this miracle. What can God do now? Isaac had no doubt heard the story all his life about his miraculous birth, about the whole trip from, from uh, Ur to Abraham and Sarah took and the stops in Egypt and all along the way and, and how finally Isaac was born. So now when his wife was having trouble conceiving, 
He knows just what to do. Because his faith had been, de- had been developed not only in his own life, but through the story of his ancestors. His ancestors could pass down their faith. He could see and hear what Abraham had been through and know what to do. And so when he, she has trouble conceiving, he talks to God about it. Praise to the Lord. Doesn't tell us how long he was praying. Doesn't tell us how many years, although we'll get to that in a minute. But Isaac knows the importance of children for the promise, and he also knows that it is God's promise, has been from the beginning, and so God will fulfill it. So if he's really thinking this is something that has to happen, let me go to God about it. It's God's issue. I'm just a vessel. So let's let's talk to God. So he asked God, hey God, my wife's having trouble uh, conceiving a child. These aren't the words. I don't know exactly what he said, but this is, you know. Can you do something here? Because we need you. Please, God, allow Rebecca to bear children. And God hears the prayer. God sees the faith. And God responds as verse 21 continues. And the Lord granted his prayer and his wife, Rebecca, conceived. I love the way it says that because it reveals that God actually listened and responded to the prayer. He granted it. It's like he said, yes, Isaac, I will do as you have requested. He grants it. It reveals that Isaac's prayer accomplished something. So oftentimes we pray and we're like, I don't know if anybody hears us. Yes, God hears it. He doesn't always grant it in that way, but God hears it. And here God saw Abram, or Isaac's faith. He knew the promise, he knew that it was all about fulfilling the promise, and God granted the prayer. Rebecca would become a mother, Isaac would become a father, Abraham would become a grandfather, so the promise could continue, and the blessing was still there, yet to be fulfilled. Hallelujah. So just when we think it's all going to work out, man, got over that hurdle, right? Hold on. Not done yet. There's still another issue, this time of a very personal nature. Verse 22 says, the children struggled within her. And she said, if it is to be this way, why do I live? And she went on to inquire of the Lord. Now, it's unclear to me whether or not she knew she was having more than one baby at this point. But she knew she was having trouble. I don't profess to know what goes on inside a woman's body when she's pregnant. I wouldn't be that stupid to try to say I understood that. But I do know there's lots of things happening. I remember when Tammy, my wife, was pregnant for Samuel. So many things happened, so many, I I, I can't get into all of it, but I do remember this. She craved mashed potatoes. And I would come home from working second shift, get home around 12, 30 at night, and she'd say, I've got to have mashed potatoes. And me being stupid would say, Did you, do we have any? Of course, if we had some, she wouldn't be craving them still. So we'd get out in the car, 12, 30 at night, and drive about 10 miles to the local 24-hour diner, and order a big plate of mashed potatoes because that's what she wanted. And if that's what she wanted, I learned early. That's what she got. Hallelujah. And then when she was pregnant for Joseph, this was, to me, perhaps more like what Rebecca was going through, but I don't pretend to know what Rebecca was going through. Just know that she was struggling very painfully. And When she was pregnant for Joseph, he was always rolling around. He was such a tempest inside her that that there was a day when she was maybe three weeks from her due date, and all of a sudden there was no movement. And he was moving around so much, so often, that he got calm just for a few hours. And we rushed to the hospital in that few hours to make sure he was okay. Because it was so out of the ordinary, we were afraid something had happened. I share this to say, I don't know what Rebecca was feeling, but maybe some of you women do. When the pain is so great, and the hormones, and the aching, and the swelling feet, and the upset stomach all make you feel as though you might rather die, that's what Rebecca was feeling. She didn't know she could go through with it. 
such a travail. I imagine it may be worse than others. I don't know because it's mentioned and it's not always mentioned in the Bible, but obviously she was struggling. She was having an issue. And what did she do when she was struggling, when she was having these issues? What did she do as an example of her faith? She inquired of the Lord. Hallelujah. Isn't that what we should do when we struggle? When we have to, maybe it's not struggle for childbirth. Maybe it's some other struggle, struggle you're going through, struggle with uh, an addiction, struggle with, with, with your, your schoolwork, struggle with your job, struggle with your family, struggle with, with anything that you have, really have a struggle with, and you're like, God, I don't know if I can go through with this. I don't know what the point is. Go talk to the Lord. Go talk to the Lord. Bring God in on a conversation, because I'm here to tell you, God created you, and God loves you, and God wants to be in on the conversation. God made you for a purpose and a reason. He has a plan and a life that he wants you to live and enjoy. Bring him on the, in on the conversation. Let God know what and how you're feeling, because God knows more about you than you do. God knows more about what's going on than you ever will. He knows more, I, I, maybe it's surprising to you, he knows more than the doctors know. I'm just going to say it. <laughs> he knows more than all those people who think they know everything. Because God does know everything. And God knows what you're going through in a way that we could never understand. And he cares for you. He may not always answer in the way we want to answer, but he always hears and he always cares. And in this case, God did answer. In verse 23, it says, And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples born of you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The elder shall serve the younger. Well, she didn't know before. She knew now that she was having more than one child. <laughs> I mean, two nations struggling in her womb. That knowledge alone may have calmed her, perhaps realizing that all this jostling, this unsettling, maybe realizing that this was not just one giant octopus of a child with eight limbs and two heads moving all about, but that there was two. Maybe that would calm her a little bit. I mean, I can't imagine what that would feel like. It's, it's not going to burst some ungodly creature. No. Two nations. Nevertheless, God answered her inquiry with some specific knowledge. Most of this would become useful several chapters later as the boys grew up to be men. But for the sake of the promise, we see this is part of the promise. There are two nations. Just as God said that Abraham would be father of more than one nation, we see here it begins in just the, the second generation. Or maybe it's the third. I don't know generations very well. After Isaac, then comes Two nations. We see it begins with two from Isaac and Rebekah. The promise is being fulfilled. Two different nations, one stronger than the other, one serving the other. Probably not quite what she wanted to hear, but the truth nonetheless. You see, God specializes in the truth, not just what we want to hear. That's another sermon I could preach. But God was fulfilling the promise to Abraham through Isaac. And the passage continues in verse 24. When her time to give birth was at hand... There were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy mantle, so they named him Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand gripping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. Well, that's an interesting tidbit of information. Okay, so Isaac wasn't 100 years old like Abraham. But he wasn't a spring chicken either. He had still been through 20 years of marriage with no children. 20 years of believing the promise and not seeing it. 20 years of saying, God, you know, I know I'm supposed to, you know, uh, have some seed because Abraham's supposed to be the father of many nations and I'm just here by myself. 20 years of God, when are you going to do something? We'd like to think 20 years is a long time. Not with God. 20 years is nothing. God's like, I said it's going to happen. What are you so rushed about? 
for Isaac 20 years without the promise, only to finally have it fulfilled. How long was he praying for Rebecca? I don't know. I don't know if he waited till 19 years to start praying, but I don't think so. I think he was probably praying for her for close for 20 years. Have you ever done that, prayed for somebody for so long, for so long? Sometimes we pray and pray and pray, and things don't work out the way we want them to. But don't stop praying. We don't know when God's going to do something amazing. We see in this birth a little foreshadowing as well. We know that Esau came out first, all hairy and red, and Jacob came out holding on to his heel. I always thought that was kind of funny. (laughs) Because the passage says they struggled within her, and so I kind of think he's like, you ain't getting away from this fight so easy. Come back in here, boy. (laughs) That's kind of... It's kind of just my mind. It's weird. Okay. But I, I just thought it was kind of funny. Maybe he's like, wait a minute. I'm going out first, not you. But Esau's like, sorry, sucker. You know, he's just out there. Of course, his name actually in Hebrew means holder of the heel. That's what Jacob means, which is sometimes translated supplanter, which could indicate his ambition and foreshadowing what is to come. We might see some of that next week. However, perhaps the most foreshadowing actually comes in the following verses. Verse 27 and 28. Verse 27 says, When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man, living in tents. We see that these will indeed be two different nations, for they are very different men, different interests. Different lifestyles. It reminds me, sort of similar to two other brothers who were very different in their, in their way, although it turned out a lot worse for them, Cain and Abel. Remember, they had different ideas on how to live, and I'm sure you're familiar with that story. And if you're familiar with this story, we know that the potential for that will happen as well. But the struggle between Esau and Jacob goes on for quite some time in the story in the book of Genesis. We're not going to cover all that in this series, but you can certainly read that at your leisure. But we know that there is some treachery yet to come, some supplanting, as it would be, some holding on to the heel, some grasping for what is not yours yet. Uh, We're going to learn about that next week, but as I've always contended... I've always believed that most of the problems are a result of verse 28, which says, Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. That's a strange verse because it shows me that clearly each parent had a favorite, and I'm here to tell you, and I'll tell you next week in case you miss it, favoritism causes trouble, and we'll see that next week. But for this week, we see God is fulfilling his promise. He fulfilled the promise by giving Abraham a child, Isaac. But that's not the end of the promise. Then he continues to fulfill the promise by giving Isaac and Rebekah, Jacob and Esau. But you know, that's not the end of the promise either. Abraham's seed is spreading. Even when things look dire, God is still working. Part of what I want us to see this morning is that sometimes we wonder, where is God in the midst of this? We want to be able to hit the easy button, but we have to keep faith. We have to keep faith. Even when we're struggling, even when we don't know how can we go on, how can we continue, keep faith, because God will fulfill his promises to us. Even if it takes longer than we think it should. God will complete his plans because God's ways are not our ways. God's ways are higher and and bigger and, and wider and deeper and better than anything we can come up with. So we might think we haven't figured out, but you know what? God has something better than that. Hallelujah. He thinks in dimensions we do not understand. And that's how his promise to Abraham to bless the world would seem to be that, that it would be 
the nation of Israel that would be perhaps the leader of the whole world. But that was not God's plan. That's what Abraham might have thought. Isaac, Jacob, all throughout the centuries, that might be what they thought. But God's plan was so much better. It was simply through the nation that Jesus would be born. And that Jesus would give hope to all humanity. Not just one nation, but all the nations. He knew, God knew, the promise would be truly fulfilled when Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came to earth to fulfill the covenants, to fulfill the law, to fulfill the promise, and to redeem humanity. He knew when he taught the nation of Israel how to live, when Jesus came to teach Israel how to live, that he would fulfill the promise by dying on the cross. Who would have thought that? The death would be fulfilling the promise, and yet death only revealed his divinity as he sacrificed himself for our sins, resurrected from the grave, proving he was God, and ascending to heaven until he is ready to return and call us home. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. He did all the work so that we who would choose to believe could be blessed with life, fulfilling life here and eternal life forever. And that is the promise, that all the world would be blessed. God is still fulfilling the promise today to you and to me. And if we don't have it fulfilled yet for ourselves, we can trust God, walk in faith, believe, because he wants to fulfill it for you today if you put your faith and trust in Jesus. Don't miss out on God's promise today because God will fulfill his promise to you. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for being the fulfillment of the promise. Thank you for giving us hope, for giving us life, for giving us new life, for forgiving our sins and helping us to start over when we do wrong and we so often do wrong. We know that we can come to you and confess our sins and you are faithful and just to forgive them so that we can start over. We can begin anew. We can love you. We can, we can be made whole. Thank you for restoring us to life. We pray today that if any haven't found that hope and faith in you, today they would, that they would put their trust in you because of all you are, because of all that your word said and declared, and you lived out and became. Lord, we just pray that you would help us each day to walk in faith, to trust when we cannot see, to know that it doesn't get easy, but it does get better, to know that you will always be with us, you will never forsake us, and we never ever, ever walk alone. Thank you, Jesus, for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.